And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. I remember discovering Isaiah 6 when I was a teenager. A very enthusiastic teenager. A complex teenager whose enthusiasm for God was vividly real but was also fed by a desperation to escape the banalities of life in a small country town. I had to make my life mean something. I needed to be caught up in something big and important because otherwise, well, why did God put me here? I clearly remember praying with Isaiah, here I am, send me, please send me. I prayed those words with all the naivety and innocence and enthusiasm of a teenager who really believed that God would change the world through me if I just fully surrendered myself to God's will. I read this passage now as an adult, a highly educated adult but also a highly chastened adult. And when I read it, it always brings to mind that time of innocence and naivety. But I look at this passage through very different eyes now. I have seen the error in reading Bible passages as though they were written primarily to, for and about me. Immediately casting myself in the role of Isaiah in this passage may have been just a little bit presumptuous. When I look at this passage now, <clears throat> I see it is not about me, but about the nature of prophetic ministry. And why is that important for us to look at today? Well, look around, look at the world, look at the church. Wouldn't you say we are in desperate need of some prophets? some prophets to help us find the path of wisdom. So it's worth trying to get a bit of a grasp on prophetic ministry. A lot of people think that prophecy is the same thing as, as fortune telling. But when you look closely at biblical prophecy, you see it's not actually really about predicting the future at all. It is more about understanding, really understanding the here and now. The prophets deeply and accurately understood their world and they held this understanding together with their knowledge of history and their knowledge of God and brought those three things together to track a trajectory into the future. You see, if you truly know where you have come from and you really understand where you are right now, then it, it actually isn't that hard to predict what might happen next. The special insights of the prophets was not their knowledge of the future, it was their thorough grasp of history, the character of God and the present reality of their world. If we look at the Anglican Church in Australia, at our past hundred years or so, at our current state, the current state of so many of our parishes, and the current state of polarisation in religious debate all over Australia. If we look at all those things, then we don't need to be psychic at all to predict that we might be heading into a very dark time indeed if we stay on the course we are currently on. And that if 
is important. The prophets insisted that the future had not been decided. This is where you are heading, they would say, but it doesn't have to be that way. If you change direction, then the future will change. The prophets understood their current reality and so could see where they, things were heading in their world. And Isaiah's current reality was about as ominous as it gets. His call came in the year that King Isaiah died. Now that sounds innocuous, doesn't it? Until we remember that for most nations, for most of history, the power vacuum after the death of a king meant insecurity, instability, and the real possibility of war. The year that King Isaiah died was all these things and much more. The year that King Isaiah's son ascended to the throne at Jerusalem was just five <coughs> years after another new king had begun to rule another nation, a nation to the northeast of Jerusalem. That other king was Tiglath Pileser III of Assyria. Now that name might, you know, that might not be a household name uh, at this time, but that king will have an impact on King Isaiah's people and his descendants that will be utterly devastating. Tiglath Pileser's aggressive empire building saw the northern kingdom of Israel wiped out, utterly destroyed. And the southern kingdom barely survived. But the state and the state they did survive, but the status of their king, the king in Jerusalem, was permanently reduced to that of a vassal, paying tribute to the aggressive superpower to the north. From that point on, throughout their history, the name of that super, superpower changed from time to time, from Assyria to Babylon to Persia to Greece to Rome, but Jerusalem never again came out from under foreign rule, at least not until recently. The year that King Isaiah died was just about the most ominous year in the history of the ancient Jewish people. It was a turning point from prosperity to poverty, from security to slavery, from a throne to a footstool. And that, that was the year when God turned up. That was the year in which God appeared to the prophet Isaiah. That was the level of chaos and fear into which God chose to speak. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, Isaiah says, high and lofty and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Now, you might take a look at the hem of your, your dress or your skirt or your trousers. Mine's, mine's actually about that big. It's a fairly big hem. Yours might be just that big. Imagine how big you would have to be for the hem of your garment to fill one of the largest buildings in the ancient world. The prophet sees, sees God as enormous, above the temple, seated on a throne. Now keep in mind that from this time on, the throne of the king in Jerusalem will never be secure. But God's throne, God's rule, is not in doubt. Whatever happens to Isaiah's son or his great-great-grandson, 
God will always be on the real throne, the lasting throne. For the next few centuries after this, it is going to look as though Assyria or Babylon or Greece or Rome is in control. When I was growing up, the superpowers were the US and the USSR. They would decide the future of the world and perhaps whether the world would have a future or not. Now it's US and China and with Russia trying to make a comeback. But that is only one perspective. There is also the perspective of history and the perspective of God's character. The prophet sees the enormity of God and hears how God is worshipped, not just by the people in the temple, but by all creation, as represented by those strange creatures who cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. When my kids were tiny, I would pray with them at bedtime and they would sometimes ask me whether or not animals pray. And I would say, well, of course they do. Humans are the only creatures who ever forget to pray. All creation praises the creator. The prophet sees this. God enthroned enormous holy and a bit scary and the prophet knows he has no right to enter that throne room woe is me he says i am lost for i'm a man of unclean lips and i live among a people of unclean lips in that temple there was worship and sacrifice but the lips that worshiped and the hands that sacrificed were stained with duplicity and violence but the prophet isn't blaming them here. He comes to God as one of his people. He identifies with them. He knows that their stain is his stain. And his cleansing is the only way for him to speak a new word, a cleansing word, a word from God to these people. Then he says, one of the seraphs flew to me holding a live coal that had been taken out of the altar with a pair of tongs, the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. His clean lips respond to God's summons with the words, here I am, send me. There is still enough of the naive teenager in me for these to still be among my favourite words in scripture. Hineni, it is in Hebrew. Here I am, Lord. I don't have the answers. I don't have the courage or the strength or the ability that is needed, but I stand before you, ready to do whatever it is you ask. It takes guts. To stand in that place of apparent calm. Here, here I am, send me. If we read on, we find in chapter 20 that Isaiah will be told to walk around the city naked for three years. How can you give your allegiance to a God who might tell you to do that? And as if wanting to underscore Isaiah's naivety, God chooses this moment to present Isaiah with his job description. Go and say to these people, keep listening but do not comprehend. Keep looking but do not understand. Make the mind of these people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lay waste, without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate, until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Go, 
and speak a word that will be ignored and keep speaking it until the people and places you love have been destroyed. You will not be a success. You will not save your people from the destruction that is coming. You will stand naked, shouting into an approaching cyclone and your voice will not be heard. If you've watched the movie, don't look up. You know that things have not changed very much at all. And that makes me think twice about saying to God, here I am, send me. Am I prepared to open my eyes in my own time of chaos and see that in spite of all the evidence to the contrary, God is still on that throne, enormous and still a bit scary? Am I prepared to identify with the corruption and deception around me rather than standing back, criticizing it? Am I prepared to take all that corruption to the throne of God and seek forgiveness, not just for myself, but for my church, for my nation, for my world? Am I prepared to go to that throne room and speak God's word to go from that throne room and speak God's word to a corrupt people? Am I prepared to keep speaking that word even when nobody listens? Do I even want to know where my church and world are heading when I know I am powerless to stop the cyclone? It's not a lack of calling or giftedness that keeps us from prophetic ministry. It is fear. But unlike Isaiah, today's prophets are not alone, or at least they shouldn't be. The church is called to be a prophetic community, standing in fellowship and speaking the word of God into the cyclone of human chaos. Isaiah 6 ends with a reference to the holy seed. Like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is filled, the holy seed is that stump. These words point to Jesus as the seed, but they also point beyond Jesus to the plant that will grow from the seed. That is the church. The church is not only the voice of prophecy, we are also the outcome of prophecy. As we stand in fellowship and speak a word from God into the cyclone of human chaos, we are forming the church of tomorrow, becoming the prophetic community God has called us to be. Now we are probably not forced, not called to face the violence of Isaiah's time, I hope not. But we are called to be the church in our time of confusion, chaos and transition. And in this time, we need to acknowledge our fear. It is scary. We, but we need to stand together in faith and call our community to stand with us. And we call them by standing with them. And we hold on to each other so that none, none of us is alone as the cyclone approaches. And in that place of fear and chaos, may you catch a glimpse of the glory of God. Amen.